Thank you so much for having me. And uh, it was so beautiful to have adoration first. And uh, yeah, there's something um, so, so LA, so paradoxical about kneeling in the middle, before the Blessed Sacrament, in front, in the middle of Hollywood, off 10 feet from Sunset Boulevard. And uh, I was actually, um, I'm very proud of the fact that I was confirmed and took my first communion at the Church of the Blessed Sacrament right down the street here. So um, when you say that in other parts of the country, they all just like erupt into maniacal laughter because they can't believe that, that there's actually a Catholic church in Hollywood. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, yeah, what, what I'd like to talk about is just uh, is, the, is my vocation as a writer and a speaker particularly a writer in Los Angeles. Um, and I can't really talk about that without giving you some background. Because um, my whole, I, I came, uh, I come from the coast of New Hampshire, and I moved to Los Angeles in 1990. I became a Catholic in Los Angeles, and I became a writer in Los Angeles. And I just got a, uh, a weekly column in the tidings, the Archdiocesan newspaper of Los Angeles. There's a new editor-in-chief, in case everybody doesn't know. He's 36 years old. He's young. He comes from Phoenix. He was uh, editor-in-chief of their uh, diocesan newspaper for 12 years, uh, J.D. Long-Garcia. Long, Long and um, he hired me to do a column on arts and culture. And I, I could barely sleep. I mean, I can barely sleep now. It was six weeks ago, probably, that we first met, or maybe two months. And, um, and I said to him, oh, this is just fantastic, because they hadn't had such a, um, such a column before. And I said, I said something like, um, what was, uh, something that indicated, oh, we're catching up to everyone. I mean, I just assumed every, every archdiocesan newspaper would naturally have a column on arts and culture. And he said, no, none of them do. Um, and, and that is, uh, you know, as a convert, I'm still learning about Catholic culture. And it's, and I'm, it's always a little bit of a shock. But I was, I was actually astounded at that. Um, and as I tell my story, I mean, my, I came to... Um, my humanity and to my sobriety and to the church so much through, uh, I, to me, books are incarnational. I've been a huge reader since the day I learned to read when I was, I've had a library card continuously since the age of six. And so um, to me, it's just an absolute no-brainer that arts, that culture, that literature, that film, music would, is such an entree into into religion, into faith, into the binding back together. Anyway, the point is, it's um, after 20 years of writing to be asked, uh, 20 years of writing, and I was confirmed in 1996, so 18 years as a Catholic, to be asked to, to write a weekly column for the tidings is just so dear to my heart. In a way, it's, it's the fruit of, of all the work that I've done thus far. I wasn't looking for, didn't even know such a position existed. And, uh, but, but the point is it's Los Angeles. And so I will get to, um, I've always, Los Angeles to me is just a mystery and a paradox and, and uh, has such a bad reputation still in the rest of, if you go and travel anywhere, everyone always, they just hate LA. I don't, I don't, I can't, especially if you come from the East Coast. I mean, my own family still, after 24 years, refuses to ask any question about my life or where I live. I mean, they just think LA is the anti -crime. I mean, they're just like, why would you move there? And um, so anyway, I really want to, um, uh, and, and I'm very open to suggestions, so my email is readily available to one and all. Um, so if you have any, by the way, um, just great um, tips or ideas. But I really want to um, bring out this insane spectrum of what we have here in Los Angeles. I, I've already written, I think, four pieces, and one of them was on the pollinator garden. There's a new 
Uh, there's, I think, two and a half acres of gardens outside the Natural History Museum down by USC. Beautiful gardens, and in particular, there's one called the Pollinator Garden. And as soon as I saw that, my heart just leapt because I just, I, I, I didn't even really know what a pollinator garden was, but I just loved this out. I knew it would be great. And I went down there and wrote a piece about it, and I managed to tie in sort of L.A. history and my own history in L.A. and, and brought in Christ at the end. And um, so I just find this really unbelievably exciting to um, just our daily life, looking at that and living it and experiencing it and s seeing it through the lens of the Gospels. Um, but anyway, so let me just tell a little bit about how I came to be a writer, um, and especially the kind of writer that I am. Um, which is really uh, the story of how I came to Christ. Because um, my conversion and my uh, uh, finally, finally, um, really kind of late in life coming to my vocation as a writer uh, occurred almost simultaneously. So they have forever and will be forever very, very deeply linked. Um, both, to me, a laying down of your life, a lifelong commitment, a sacred, sacred honor. So. Um, but just briefly, born in the coast of New Hampshire, big family, eight kids, Protestant, went to the white steepled congregational church, um, lovely, decent, hardworking, self-sacrificing parents uh, who were not alcoholics. I think six of us kids are alcoholics and or drug addicts. And our life. So we had alcoholism, the disease of alcoholism, and all everything that goes along with alcoholism, which is shame and secrets and neurotic guilt and terrible, terrible sense of not being enough that everyone else has been given the rule book, etc. And uh, I was a straight A student, I had all kinds of things going for me in the outside, um, athletic, I played the piano, and I just felt deeply, uh, I just felt it's kind of this, this I think in, in one way you can almost describe alcoholism as a kind of uber- cognizance of the fall. It's kind of this deep sense of exile, uh, for me anyway, just kind of taken to the millionth degree. And um, anyway, I um, started drinking when I was a freshman in high school, and I had a 20-year run of just hardcore, sleazy barroom, squandering my inheritance in the mire, um, alcoholism. Uh, I managed to graduate from uh, I got to be in social service because, don't you know, I did want to help people. Grew up during the 60s and 70s, and mm -hmm. um, we were for the underdog in my family. We were for the welfare mother. Um, we were for the little league pitcher with leukemia. So I had that deep sense of um, I saw there was suffering in the world, and, uh, and I wanted to alleviate, and I just couldn't get to it because of my own, uh, my own, my alcoholism and my uh, just blocks, wounds, childhood wounds. So anyway, it went on like that for a long time. I went to law school also and graduated from law school while I was drinking in the throes of acute alcoholism. And um, people think alcoholics don't have any willpower, but it's not, we have insane willpower on everything except booze and drugs. So um, I actually managed to um, go, graduate from Suffolk Law School and passed the Massachusetts Bar. Um, anyway, finally got sober, family sent me to rehab, um, found beautiful, beautiful fellowship that has supported me, shored me up, taught me how to be a stand-up human being. 27 years I've been in that fellowship. And, uh, and really that was my first uh, fellowship of sober recovering alcoholics. And that was my first when I first got sober, which was in 1987, that was when I began to have an idea of God because I was so, so grateful. Um, I, to this day, I can't believe that I no longer have to drink one day at a time. I mean, literally, I just felt like I was sentenced. It is the war, it's like the, the, the demoniac in, the, uh, in the, the, the one that throws himself into the fire in the Gospels and, and <coughs> rips the chains off and, and Christ says, this kind needs prayer. That's the alcoholic. And um, so deeply grateful. And I looked around and really 
my idea of God, I mean, not that I hadn't, I went to Sunday school and everything, but I really thought God was just kind of irrelevant for people who weren't sophisticated and didn't live in a city like I had lived in Boston. You know, I thought it was for kind of prairie people or something. Um, But I began, um, you know, really I had a prodigal daughter experience, and, um, and I began to look around for someone to thank. And, um, you know, really, Meister Eckhart, 13th century mystic, has this beautiful line, um, the last line of my first book, Parched, and he says, if the only prayer you said in your life was thank you, that would be enough. And, um, and that was how I really began to come to God, because I wanted someone to thank. When you're really grateful, you don't want to thank an abstraction. You don't want to thank a philosophy. You don't. You want to thank a person. And um, and as I look back, I hadn't come to Christ yet, but I really. But that is all germane because when I did come to Christ, it was as a member of the crowd that heard the Sermon on the Mount. And that, I mean. One of my favorite lines in the Gospels is, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. And um, I just somehow, I began to read the Gospels when I was working as a lawyer in Beverly Hills. I got sober in Boston. I got married very early in sobriety. We moved out here past the California bar, and I had this whole idea, okay, I'm starting to believe in God. And I did the thing that a lot of us do, which is, God must want me to do the grim, hard thing, which for me was being a lawyer. I had no desire to be a lawyer. I, I, my jo- I always joke, even agreeing with people makes me nervous. Never mind, you know, <laughs> litigation. I mean, I was like constant <laughs> confrontation and fight. I mean, it's so, I just want to be in a corner reading Emily Dickinson and <laughs> <laughs> sobbing. Um, <laughs> looking at the flowers, and um, so um, I was I was working as a lawyer in Beverly Hills, and um, and uh, yeah, because I passed the master's bar, I got this job, and um, and this is where I had um, huge spiritual crisis because I had come to God, and I had really started to clean up big time. I mean, I was married; we eloped. So, so not Catholic yet, but got married by a justice of the peace. But even then, I knew marriage is a sacrament. I knew this is for life. I don't want to be hanging around. I don't want to be that person who was hanging around the bars. This is a lifelong. It was really, I think deep in us, we really have this um, innate, um, not only an urge to worship, but to be obedient, to be called to our highest selves. And because I'd been obedient to nothing but myself for so long, um, all of that just was extremely attractive to me. I wanted, I wanted to be called higher. So anyway, married, and, um, but I did, I thought, um, I didn't want to be a lawyer, but I thought, now come on, you have got to step up to the plate. I was almost 40 at the time, by this time, and... Um, uh, I just thought, I mean, everyone tells you if you have a law degree how lucky you are. And I felt like I should be grateful. People would give their right arm for this, for a law degree. Look, you have this high-paying job in Beverly Hills. But what happened was um, I began, first of all, I, my heart and my soul were just shriveling, number one. And number two, what came back and it never really died, but I thought I must have squelched it with those years of drinking. But what came back was this deep, deep call, literally a call of my heart that I'd had since I was, again, since really the day I learned to read practically, to be a writer. And I had such reverence for writers that I really thought, um, I think it was so big, I just couldn't go near it in a way. I don't know if anyone can identify with that, but I think when we know the thing, we feel this way about people sometimes. You know when you're really crazy about someone and you're, there's no one you want to, more to be close to, but you're afraid to get too close to. And that's, I think, somewhat how I felt about writing. And I, on some level, I knew if this is what you choose, it's going to be, 
obviously a new birth, or in a way my, my true birth, but also a death. And um, so anyway, but the point is the call came back and I'm making money for the first time in my life. I'd been a waitress the whole time I drank. Horrible waitress, ADD, surly, <laughs> waitress, worst waitress ever. Um, but I just didn't know how to do anything except be a waitress or be a lawyer, both of which I hated. And so I get this call, and I'm just thinking, oh, God, please, you've got to be kidding me. I'm going to quit my job as a lawyer. I'm going to embark on the, pro everyone knows, writers don't make any money. I mean, and I knew I'm not going to be a TV writer or someone who actually makes money. I just knew I'm going to be writing essays about my mother. <laughs> um, you know, like creative, creative writing. I just knew that's, I, I didn't exactly know what I was going to write, but I knew it was not going to be anything that would have a huge audience. <laughs> and, um, so anyway, but I really, I really began to, um, I began to realize this was a um, uh, deep, it was a spiritual crisis and it really had to do with God. And I began to realize what little idea I had of, of sin. I began to realize if I did not have the courage to at least try to do, to embark on this, to, to answer this call of my heart, that that would be the biggest sin ever. And I had a real bad track record. I mean, I had a lot of, I was a single barroom drinker, a lot of wreckage, but I realized, no, this is, you know, that kind, I had that dawning with no theology at all. I just intuitively understood God wants us to come alive. And, um, and that's the real, that's the real gospel adventure. And I started to by this time, I'd actually started to read the Gospels. I took, somehow I still had my childhood Bible. I'd been baptized when I was 10 or something. I had kept this Bible all these years with my name written in gold, Reverend Cherrier. And, um, and I somehow had this Bible with me at work in Beverly Hills. Um, and I started to read the Gospels. And I, it was just kind of a classic, oh, this is... This is the blueprint. This is the only possible way to live in this world with any kind of integrity. Um, I, just into, I just fell in love with the person of Christ, the astonishing kind of non sequitur, never says what you think he's going to say. It always throws you off balance, but always cuts to the heart and at the same time gives says these things that you could just go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into, that it's truly living water. Um, and I saw, I saw that the, when, they, when, they, when the Christ goes out into the desert to be tempted, I saw that was the temptation that I was facing. It's a temptation we all face because really the temptation is, except it's couched in this way that is, doesn't seem so stark, but for a lot of us, the temptation is, and our culture totally, totally says this is, this is fine, this is admirable, and the temptation is to work for 30 or 40 years at a job that you make a ton of money or enough money and you moderately to intensely despise. And you will get, especially if you're a lawyer, you'll get awards, you'll get three cars, you'll get a vacation home, and everyone will tell you how great you are and you're doing good work. And I just saw that is, that is a hideous, hideous lie. Like, that is a waste of a life. I cannot let that, you know, I've already lost a lot of my life to drinking. I can't do that. And I really, I think that is, that is the system, you know, the, that Satan takes you up on that parapet and says, hey, it can all be yours. So, anyway, somehow, the other thing is I started going around to, to churches. I found I... I really, um, I just had this innate, this person that I wanted to thank, I wanted to thank more. And I began to, um, oh, people go to church on Sundays. And I started going around to um, um, Protestant churches, because that's what I've been raised with. And so I hit all, I hit the Presbyterian and the Lutheran and the Methodist and the Baptist. I just, I went to all of them. I went to the Unitarian at one point, which was really 
<laughs> it was just weak. And again, I, I mean, I can't. And the reason I told this is because I love all the stuff about the shepherd. You know, the sheep, my sheep hear my voice. And when you're super, super hungry and searching, you somehow, you don't even need the other, you will find his voice because it is the authentic voice. It's the only authentic voice. And somehow, I just knew, no, I don't want to be with people who, who say the J word. Like, that's literally, they would not say Jesus. They referred to Christ as the J word, and I just thought, oh, no. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of went to every single church. I moved up to the Episcopal. And, you know, I've been raised in um, uh, pre-Vatican to New Hampshire, where literally back in those, I mean, you just did not even go into a Catholic church if you were Protestant. And so um, it was, I just had a whole, oh, the Catholics, they're scary and they're rigid, you know, all the stereotypes. And um, I just, it's just the absolute last place I ever thought I'd end up is the point. But um, finally, there was kind of no place left. And um, and I'd also, I'm a huge reader. And so I had, by this time, I was reading and I was reading just very eclectically Chesterton. And I remember reading Chesterton's um, biography of St. Francis. And, um, and that, you just kind of catch fire with the thing. I read this great book, Romano Gardini's The Lord, just deep, about, again, about the person of Christ. And um, so anyway, I finally found my way to a noon mass at St. Basil's in Korea. I was living in Korea at the time. And, uh, and um, I just, um, I, heart pounding made my way in. And I really thought they might sort of stop me and ask me for my credentials. Or I thought I would just do some, commit some horrible faux pas. Um, and um, and I just went and um, and literally as as a worshiper I couldn't follow the line I didn't sort of understand I just stood up and knelt when everyone else did but um but um, I heard um, Lord I am not worthy to receive you but only say the word and I shall be healed that's that's what we said then and that that I zeroed in on healed I knew I needed to be healed and that was literally from that day forward I found that. I, RCIA, it was before the internet even, and some, you just had the yellow pages, and I called around, and I ended up at Church of the Blessed Sacrament. So, um, and also during that time, I'm a huge um, Flannery O'Connor fan, and I always like to give credit to Flannery, because um, another thing that helped me was, um, because I just agonizing about whether I should, I didn't want to be a quitter, and I thought if I quit, I was just so afraid of being the pipe dream nutcase that I had been all my life it, as far as quitting this job as a lawyer and, and embarking on the life of a writer. And in a letter of Flannery O'Connor, she says, um, uh, God cares nothing for gracefulness nor success. He only cares that we do the best we can with what we've been given. And it was just one of those lines that just pierced my heart and literally gave me permission to um, to quit my job and just to start writing. I think one of the other systems that were so that keeps us in such unbelievable bondage is the fear of being made fun of, the fear of being a loser, um, which again our culture is we're just inundated the whole so much of media it just I mean, I grew up in a family with eight kids. We ridiculed each other mercilessly. So, but that the the fear of failing, of and of course, being a Catholic in this culture is a whole other. That's a whole other version of that. But um, but for whatever reason, um, I think maybe because it, it, my my alcoholism, I already for someone of. Um, we didn't have a lot of money. I came from a blue-collar family, but still, I mean, I, we were well, we were, we listened to music, we read books. I mean, for someone of my demographic who had a law degree, um, I had fallen so far. I'd been so off the rate, so off the grid when I was drinking, so um, in a kind of self-imposed exile. I think in a way this stood me in good stead because I already had been so far out of the mainstream. Not that I want to set myself apart in any way, but I think it actually set me up to be a writer. And when I did begin to write, um, I mean, literally, I quit the job and 
I took Flannery O'Connor as my model. She wrote four hours a day. I read, and um, and so that's what I would. That's that was what I did. And I'm very, very. Um, uh, it's one of my few. Um, I don't even know if you want to call it a virtue, but um, I'm just very, very disciplined, or I have been about writing. I mean, just I didn't. I never had a mentor. I didn't. I just did, I just wrote what came from my heart, and then I would try to sell it somewhere eventually. I served a long kind of self-imposed apprenticeship, complete obscurity, and literally making maybe $18,000 a year. I got freelance work as a lawyer, but I just knew this is what I was made for. If I never sell anything, that doesn't matter. This is what I was made for. It's what I'm called to do. And, um, and so that's what I did for years and years. And I began eventually to send stuff out. Again, this was before e-mail even. So you'd have to I'd make 10 copies of the essay and self-addressed stamped envelope, go to the mailbox. And, um, and that's what I did, though. And that was, that was part of the discipline. No, part of your job is you have to get the stuff out in the world. I have a hideous, hideous abandonment wound and fear of reach I mean just deep um, and but because I knew it was my cause somehow you just I was able to withstand the constant reject if anyone's a writer you just know I mean the rejection the failure the complete lack of validation the ignominious um, insulting <laughs> belittling way that I mean and lots of kind of um, Oh, I remember someone contacted me quite early on. Oh, would you like to write a book about your conversion? I look back on this, and again, this was a huge blessing. But at the time, I thought, oh, did the proposal and sample chapters and just my heart. Oh, oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And it dragged on and on and on and on. And finally, it was a no. It just fell. The thing completely fell through. But as I look back... I mean, I see these people today who they convert and then they have a best-selling book about their conversion three months later or something. And I think, hmm, I, I can't think of anything. Um, I mean, more power to anybody. But for me, I so crave validation and attention. I, I can't think of anything that would have been more detrimental to my spiritual path than to be rewarded for convert like why would you what you don't get rewarded for conversion means you're willing to die so to be reward no conversion costs you something plus you don't even know what it is for I wrote a book about my conversion and it was 12 years after I'd converted I mean and even then I barely know even now 18 years later it, it just takes a long long time to even know what your life in Christ is is about but anyway, so that's how it went, and and deeply, um, always Los Angeles, as I said, this kind of um, crazy, glorious, paradoxical, love-hate, squalor, abundance, uh, it, it, you live here, you know, I mean, it's just, one second you think, I live in paradise. I mean, the lilies of the Nile, the sun will be streaming through, and the bougainvillea, and the 530 mass with the sun coming through the stained glass window. And then you'll be on the five in the city of industry or something. And just like, you'll just think, you're kidding me. Of all the places in the world, I mean, there's like Greece, there's Tuscany. No, what, how did I end up here? But I love that about Los Angeles because it's very, it's just a perfect place to contemplate um, the darkness and the light, the, uh, the intersection of the cross. And, um, and Los Angeles has totally informed, um, just informed my work because I literally, I write essays and memoir. And so, and, um, and right away I saw the gospels played out in my daily life, literally with the neighbor that I hated, with my husband, who's now my ex-husband. Um, I wrote a lot about 
Koreatown, just literally describing. I'm a huge walker. That's another thing. And I'm a big, this is another thing I want to do in the tidings. Get out of your car, get out of your apartment, and go take a walk. You don't need equipment. You don't need an odometer. Just walk. And wherever I have been in L.A., I mean, I'll go to the DMV and, they'll, you know, they'll, you have to wait half an hour. I'll go and walk around the neighborhood. I've been a mass all over the place. I'm going to do a piece on, do you all know about masstimes.org? Mm -hmm. It's the, right? Yeah. It's the website for traveling Catholics. And so you can put in your zip code or, or your town, wherever you are. But I'm going to encourage people to do that in Los Angeles because... You can, you know, say your dentist is in Beverly Hills. You do the little thing, and, oh, there's a noon mass at Good Shepherd. Because I'm a real believer in, um, that's another thing. I've so been formed by daily mass. And I go to the 530 mass a lot at Immaculate Heart of Mary in East Hollywood. Um, there's a 7 p.m. mass at Holy Trinity in Atwater. I go to 7 a.m. mass at the cathedral. There's uh, St. Francis right in Silver Lake where I live. Um, and I think, um, you know, someone was asking me before about how do I find the, the quiet in the city. And um, when, we, when we were sitting, when we were in the courtyard um, with the Blessed Sacrament, I just flashed on how many retreats. I'm constantly going off. I mean, Valiermo, St. Andrew's Abbey. I've been to New Camaldoli and Big Sur. I've driven to... Arizona to go to where I'm retreat at St. Rita's Abbey there. Just all kinds of convents and monasteries and retreat houses. I've done lots of, um, I've done two, three month stints in um, Taos, New Mexico. There's a wonderful writer's residency there, artist residency. Uh, the Helene Wurlitzer Foundation, which I, it's great. You get your own little casita. You don't have to do just Go there, and that it's yours for three months. They'd like you to go for three months so that you can get um, um, the flavor. That was part of it. Anyway, um, so, yeah, daily mass and uh, just old school. For, again, I came, as I said, I came as, uh, as someone who was poor in spirit, who was hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And, uh, and I've just never... Um, paid that much attention to Catholic um, culture in the sense of, um, for instance, today, the, to me, incredibly vitriolic, boring blogosphere. Um, I have my own blog, and when I start, I'll just tell a little bit about how I started my blog, um, which was four years ago um, when I... Uh, I was in Koreatown. I'd been in this apartment for 18 years, and um, and I hit this whole. Um, I think people can identify with this. You know how you've gone, you've you've really you've been on your pilgrimage, and you've had some lots of highs and lows, and what seem like wrong turn. But you're kind of you know you're kind of on a solid path, but you feel, and you've kind of found your thing, but you feel like there's something more. Maybe some, I'm supposed to give myself in this new way or this deeper way or there's some other. So really a deep sense of that. And I, 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 I for some reason, um, I just wanted to unburden myself. I'd lived in this apartment a long time. I, my, much of it for my marriage, which at that point had ended and, um, and I had been annulled. And, um, and I think I just wanted to kind of divest myself. So I gave away and sold a ton of my stuff and I set off I thought maybe I, my time in L.A. is up. And so, and I really deep in my heart thought I might have a call to be a contemplative hermit. Um, I'm, a, I'm a total introvert. <laughs> and plus, no, plus, like, people make me really nervous. <laughs> but I really thought, no, I mean, it's not even that funny. I mean, I, it could, because that is a call for some people. But, um, but I really thought, maybe I'm supposed to join a religious commun community or something. I didn't realize I was so old. Like, people, you know, they like people to join communities and they're, like, 25, and they have, can carry stuff. <laughs> like, they don't want someone who's in their 50s who's about to get 
ill and you know, the other <laughs> thing I didn't even know that. Plus, I can't be in any kind of community, which I've proved to myself many times, including a marriage. But anyway, so I set up and I went to Taos for three months and I did this 40 day silent retreat. Don't ask. Real, oh. Anyway, I survived this 40 day silent retreat. <laughs> Not, I loved the silence, but it was just weird for another reason. I won't go into it because I don't want to malign anybody. Um, and then I went to the Franciscan Appalachian Hermitage in Spencer, West Virginia, which is run by Sister Jeannie McNulty. I have memorialized her in a uh, Magnificat piece. And um, she's ex-Poor Claire. Um, she's in the Order of the Consecrated Virgins. She's probably 70 or so. And she's a third order Franciscan. And she has this really cool place in, in Appalachia where you can rent a little kind of makeshift cabin with like a snake or two in it for <laughs> 20 bucks a night. And, um, and she has a straw bale chapel with the Blessed Sacrament. Well, anyway, the point is I was gone for six months. At some point I realized I really missed the food in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. I started, I had this hankering for Vietnamese noodles. For, and I, I just thought, I realized, who are you kidding? I mean, your life, you were totally in the world. Your life is in L.A. I mean, you have made your life there and go back and, and be there. I had taken my, yeah, I would driven. So anyway, I came back. And the whole time I was gone, though, that six months, I had very little um, Internet access. This was four years ago. I didn't have a smartphone. And um, any time I wanted to use the Internet, I'd have to go to a library or the McDonald's or something. So I had no online presence at all. And um, and it didn't and didn't really care. But for some reason, I came back to Los Angeles, and literally, I was house sitting at this place in West Hollywood. And the day I came back, I sat down because now I had Wi-Fi again, and I just welling. This idea came welling up in me. I want to have a blog. And I had no idea. I barely had ever read. I kind of dissed blogs before as like hack work. This is typical of me. And um, and I suddenly, I just went and I just figured it out. Oh, blogger, you put get a photo, put a photo up there and a header and go to town. And I just started this blog. And, and I never meant it to be or intended to be a Catholic blog or I had no intention, I never have, of evangelizing or proselytizing. I just wanted to share the stuff that is interesting to me. And which is stuff that I read, stuff that I listen to, stuff that I reflect upon from the Gospels. I got this camera. I'd never had a camera before in my life. I go online, Amazon, refurbished. I'm super cheap, and I get, like, the Canon point-and-shoot, 90 bucks or something. I get this camera. I start to use the camera. The camera is a blast, and I have this whole thing with the camera where I start taking pictures of random leaves on sidewalks and the sunlight coming through the... Um, so I like to get, as, as I was talking to someone of Father David before, yeah, I like to get up real close. I mean, never take pictures of people because you can't get up close enough and make people stand still long enough. So I have a lot of beautiful pictures of, um, of the real, to me, the real L.A. or part of the real L.A., the incredible, I mean, where how, you could just walk down the street and the flowers and the trees and the every season of the year, jacarandas are out now. So anyway, and that was a part of my blog too. Um, and, and then, by the way, I was just sending stuff out. I had gotten my first book published, my second book published. Um, I want to say this, um, wait, how long? Am I done? What time? How long should I talk for? Okay, how about like 10 more minutes? Is that okay? Okay. Okay, all right. Well, I'll, um, obviously, I could just like go on and on. But uh, one of the things I want to say, because I know there's so many writers in here, is just I want to read a couple of great quotes um, to me. Because it's, I mean, the thing is, truly, we have to dare to be whoever the heck we are, and not try to contrive some um, persona or some calculate ourselves so that these this group will like us. Um, for whatever reason, and partly because I don't watch TV, I don't I barely read really, I'm on I'm on I'm on Facebook, but I 
I mean, I do, I work so hard that I have very, very little time to read other people's stuff. And that, in a way, is a blessing because I just, no one told me I couldn't do what I do. No one told me I couldn't write about Catholic stuff. No one told me how you're supposed to be a Catholic writer. No one, t I just have written from my heart. And, um, and okay, here's a couple quotes. Rilke, works of art always spring from those who have faced the danger, gone to the very end of an experience, to the point beyond which no human being can go. The further one dares to go, the more decent, the more personal, the more unique a life becomes. It's interesting, the more decent, like the farther, the deeper you're willing to go, the more decent you become. Um, here's Dostoevsky. They always say that art has to reflect life and all that, but it's nonsense. The writer himself creates life such as it has never quite been before him. So we all get to see LA our way. Um, or whatever, or whatever we're writing about. And then I have to put a plug in for this. Uh, Andre Tarkovsky, filmmaker. Do you all know him? Andre Rublev, Rublev uh, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, what's the stalker? Oh, gosh. I, anyway, he has this incredible book, Sculpting in Time, that I just got. I, I'd never heard of it before. It's every, I could underline, highlight every single paragraph. Anyway, here's just one paragraph from his book. In order to be free, you simply have to be so without asking permission of anybody. You have to have your own hypothesis about what you were called to do and follow it, not giving in to circumstances or complying with them. But that sort of freedom demands powerful inner resources, a high degree of self-awareness, a consciousness of your responsibility to yourself and therefore to other people. And one of the things I want to say is all the kind of career highlights, if you want to call them that, of my career have come about, have been things that I did not angle for. I got to do a bunch of commentaries for All Things Considered. The person, the producer came to me. I came home one day and there was a message on my answering machine. Hey, if you have a minute, I'm from Sarah Saracen from him, had not even applied for the thing. Magnificat, I had subscribed to Magnificat for years. My friend Rita Simmons, who's a poet in Brooklyn, friends with Father Peter Cameron, who's the editor-in-chief, gave him my book, unbeknownst to me. He called me one day. Oh, would you write, like to write for Magnificat? Same with Tidings. Had no idea. The, the, the guy asked me, emailed me, the guy, the editor-in-chief, JD. He emailed me a couple months ago. Oh, I'm new, I'm new in town. Um, he just said, I'm from, I'm from Tidings. Um, I'd love to take you out to lunch. Love your, love your stuff. Um, you know, if you ever have... I thought, oh, cute, a little cub reporter. He's like, you know, he said, oh, maybe we can crash mass together. So I knew he was young. I thought, oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> so we go out to lunch, and um, I'm stuffing this hamburger in my face. And I go, now, what do you do with the Tidings? And he goes, um, well, I'm, I'm editor-in-chief. And, um, you know, we'd love for you to write a column. <laughs> and... and um, you know, and I say that, but the, uh, but the, but what I have done is apply for a million things that I didn't get. And that, I think, is so much a part of being, I hesitate to use the word success, but just getting, getting anywhere where you want to, with, it's really going so far beyond your comfort zone to um, put yourself out there and put your stuff out there and accept invitations that seem extremely unpromising and you're always thinking, oh, where's this, my ideal audience? And then you realize, no, your audience is who, it's whoever will, you should be so lucky to have anybody, <laughs> you should be so lucky to have anyone read my stuff. And, um, and okay, and this is the last thing I want to say. And this is new. I mean, I'm a suit, as I said, I'm anxious and I'm a super, I'm very conscientious. I like to do a good job and I want to be loved and da, da. And you know how it is. We're very, very busy. And, um, and I tend to, you know, the work always comes first. And, and as I said, I mean, I have a big prayer. I, I pray, I have a whole morning thing, and I go to Mass when I can. But when push comes to shove, and especially if I, for instance, speaking, um, which makes me anxious, and I, you know, I tend to, oh, okay, i got to, like, concentrate on what I'm going to say tonight. And this morning I woke up. I had a very full day. I had... Uh, 
I met with Barbara Nicolosi. We had lunch. She's a, you all may know her. We had lunch in Pasadena. I had, I went to the gym. I had a meeting with my friend, Father Terry, who is over at St. Basil's. I had my teeth cleaned. And so we had a very full day, and I woke up this morning, and I thought, go to 8 o'clock Mass. That is how you prepare for a talk. And so I went to Mass at St. Francis. And, um, and um, beautiful line from the Gospels, if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If not, let your peace return to you. And I just thought, that is so Christ. Every, the world would say, if they don't like you, curse them. Or if they don't like you, make sure you have the last word. And he says, let your peace come back to you and keep walking, you know, and, and go to the next house. And that's, that is what informs my life, my work. It's straight old school, prayer, daily office, sacraments, confession, mass, and um, thanks be to God. So anyway, thank you so much for having me.